good morning, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce you to uh, Pavel Moschitsky. He is a philosopher, essayist, translator, and professor at the Institute of Literary Research in Warsaw. Um, he is also the editor of uh, the online academic journal View Theories and Practices of Visual Culture. He has written various books, um, starting with Politics of Theater, Essays on Engaging Art in 2008, uh, Goddard Arcades Project in 2010, The Idea of Potentiality, the Possibility of Philosophy according to Georgia Agamben in 2013, um, then there are also, are also books about uh, Guy Debord and history as a battlefield. And the latest book, it was Lessons of Football in 2019. <laughs> uh, last, last but not least, in 2016, he created an online refugee atlas uh, inspired by Abby Warburg's Builder Atlas. And beside that, he has also translated books by Alan Badu, Derek Etrich, Slavoj Žižek, and Jacques Rancière. So today he will be talking about sharing images, sharing times. So. Entity to be analyzed. 
be analyzed. So we look in it for something more that it actually shows. <clears throat> I'm already at the core of my subject, which can be formulated as follows. Do we really see images in singular? Singular images with singular subjects. What is singular and what is plural in the experience of seeing? What is individual and what is common in visibility? Finally, what is to be shared through, within, around, and in images? I'd like to discuss those questions referring to uh, Averroes ibn Rushd, the most eminent Arabic philosopher from 12th century, mostly known as a great commentator of Aristotle. The link to Dante, which I won't uh, elaborate on, is that, uh, that Dante was partly Averroes uh, philosopher, Averroistic philosopher. Although he puts Averroes uh, in the fourth canto of uh, Inferno, which is not the worst place because it's a limbo where all the human, uh, illustrious uh, poets and thinkers uh, went because they couldn't know uh, the revelation of Christ. So they are not really in the inferno, but uh, architecturally speaking, in the poem. This is uh, part one. Uh, but in uh, treatise that, treatises uh, such as, uh, for example, on monarchy, Agamben, uh, Agamben, sorry, Dante, uh, yeah, Agamben has great. <coughs> great reasons about it, uh, actually shows a lot of uh, inspirations by this uh, Arabic philosopher. Avarice uh, is famous for his idea of the unity of the intellect, so basically the idea that there exists one separate and um, common intellect for uh, every uh, thinking subject. Because of, those, uh, because of this thesis, he was severely criticized, only to be subsequently marginalized and ridiculed in the philosophical tradition. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Brenet, uh, one of the leading scholars uh, responsible for the renewal of Averroes' scholarship today, even entitled one of his books, Averroes l'inquiétant, which means uncanny Averroes referring to the Freudian notion of the uncanny to underscore the degree to which the thought of Averroes haunted and terrified Western philosophers. Just a quick scholastic reminder for those of you who forgot it or are happily not familiar with this, basic oppositions that functioned in Aristotle's metaphysics and then went on uh, through Arabic reception and commentaries to uh, late in the Middle Ages <coughs> uh, is first opposition between the potentiality and actuality, so, and then the uh, equivalent one between material and formal. Yes? So, for example, uh, I don't know, the glass uh, is made, is a composition of uh, matter, which is a potentiality uh, of uh, certain particles of the world, and it's actualized in the shape and form, and that's why it's also um, the form uh, imposed on a certain kind of matter. But these uh, oppositions work not only for material objects, but basically for every being imaginable. The dominant interpretation of Averroes by Latin philosophers, with special mention of Thomas of Aquinas and his treatise De Unitate Intellectus, on the unity of intellect, consists uh, in taking this common intellect for the actual universal subject. It becomes then, as Pene shows in his book, the omnipotent rival of every individual mind, which risks being robbed of his thoughts by this universal double. The term monopsychism, coined by Leibniz and since then constantly uh, associated with Averroes, reproduces this original misunderstanding, changing the original and impressive conception into a source of absurdities and contradictory statements. Contemporary scholars question this vision of Averroes' philosophy, underscoring, as does Emanuele Coccia, for example, that the unique intellect is, quote, not the conscious or thought, consciousness or thought in action, so in uh, the actual uh, functioning process, but a possibility of whatever idea or whatever consciousness. 
and I refer here to the brilliant uh, book by Emanuele Coce, La Transparenza delle Immagini, Averoe e Averoismo, which is the transparency of images, Averos and Averoism. And since then, Emanuele Coce is uh, kind of known for his books on sensible life and lately on metaphysics of plants. Uh, but he started as a Kocia compares it, uh, uh, the material uh, intellect, material intellect here is this one, unique and common for everyone. Kocia compares uh, it even to platonic concept of Hora, appearing in the dialogue of Timaeus, uh, mentioned yesterday, and famously commented by Jacques Derrida in his book Hora. The being of the third kind neither a material being nor an idea, a receiving space in which everything that exists finds place. Similarly, material intellect, quote, becomes everything in the sense that it founds, unifies with every form that it receives. Material intellect could be called a place not only because it contains the thinkable, but also because it becomes that by which it is affected and what it thinks. In other words, as Kocha continues, the unity of the material intellect refers not to some sort of general thinking subject living above individual minds and stealing thoughts from them, but to, quote, the original speculative plasticity in which they partake. In order to better understand the stages and functionality of this conception, let us refer to the notion of transparency or translucidity, diaphanous, many versions of it, as it is described in Aristotle's uh, treatise originally on the soul and then uh, commented by Averroes in one of his uh, <coughs> commentaries to, to this treatise by Lipsitz. Longer quote from Aristotle. Now there clearly is something which is transparent in Greek diaphanes. And by transparent I mean what is visible and yet not visible in itself, but rather owing its visibility to the color of something else. Of this character are air, water, and many solid bodies. Neither air nor water is transparent because it is air or water. They are transparent because each of them has contained in it a certain substance which is the same in both and is also found in the eternal body, which, which constitutes the uppermost shell of the physical cosmos. Of the substance, the transparent, light is the activity, the activity of what is transparent, so far forth as it has it, in it the determinate power of becoming transparent, which, where this power is present, there is also the potentiality of the contrary, which is darkness. Light is, as it were, the proper color of what is transparent. So the light is like a pre-color of the transparency and its actualization. And exists whenever the potentially transparent is excited to actuality. End of quote. This is book two, uh, 418. Then goes the commentary uh, by Averroes, who wants to use this uh, passage uh, on uh, transparency to explain what exactly he means by this general material intellect. This is the, the quote from um, one of the commentaries, but there are uh, actually three different kinds of commentaries to, uh, to the treatise on the soul. You should know that the relation of the active intellect, active intellect here is the singular intellect that is active while he thinks. So the relation of this active intellect to the material intellect <laughs> is like the relation of the light to the transparent. And that the relation of the material forms to this intellect is like the relation of color to the transparent. And just as the light is a perfection of the transparent, the active intellect is the perfection of the material. And just as the transparent is not moved by color, nor receives it unless it shines, this intellect does not receive thoughts from here unless it is perfectioned 
by the intellect and enlightened by it. End of quote. The general material intellect is thus just like this translucent, transparent being, which, while itself invisible, makes visible everything that appears. Even the light, which is a necessary condition for every being to be visible, is just the actual active form of this transparent potentiality to appear. The most important aspect of this analogy is that both the transparent and the material intellect are something intermediary, the medium, the media. The transparent, the afanes, quote here from Jean-Baptiste Brenner, again a bit longer, this transparent uh, transparency or translucidity is what is required in the act of vision, that is the condition of visibility of the visible. The condition of the pos possible perception of this or that and not the perception or the instance perceiving the visible itself. The transparent does not see. It is not the seeing subject. It makes visible, makes the individual via his or her organ and its potentiality see. Similarly, the material separated intellect, universal receptacle, of images is nothing but the condition of thinkability of the thinkable, the neutral, impersonal milieu, condition of appearance of the mental personalities, common space of the appropriation of the intelligible. Not something that thinks, but something that makes one think through the acquisition of thinking. End of quote. This is why it's dangerous, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that. This is, I think, why Averroes thought it's so dangerous, because thought is something to be acquired, it's not given uh, within the, I don't know, human identity, for example. In the commentaries to Averroes' conception of, this, of uh, the intellect, there is another recurrent metaphor, the one of the mirror. And here again, the Brenner, because he's very brilliant. <laughs> Quote, the separated intellect is for me, for individual intellect, like a mirror of the object it reflects. Thus, it does not guarantee my rationality for the act of the mirror. Yeah, the mirror like reflects its, uh, the images itself without my help. The reflection is not the work of the one it makes visible. So I'm visible in the mirror, but the mirror does the job, so to speak. In the intellect, it is me, perhaps, who appears, but the act which itself makes myself visible is not mine. I'm just a reflected being, not the reflecting. End of quote. Probably this is, this is the most painful consequence of the idea of unity of the material intellect, which decided upon its destiny in the history of philosophy. Indeed, Averroes is here not far away from Freudian revolution. Here, as in the psychoanalysis, my most intimate act of thinking requires the involvement, if, if involvement sorry, of the separated instance, in the case of uh, Freud it's uh, unconscious, here, universal intellect, in order to even be actualized. So, in, in order for me to think, something has to think me. And by that act, uh, as a light uh, actualizes the transparency, this is how uh, I, I am enlightened to think. Thus, in every intellectual insight, there is something external that operates within myself. It does not make me foreign to my sorry, it does not make me foreign to my thought. And this was probably the uh, the shock that uh, Latin philosophers had, but this is not true. On the contrary, it actually makes this thought mine, as well as it makes myself this thinking subject. It gives me the position of a thinker. But nevertheless, it shakes the subjective coherence and its self-sufficiency. So how exactly the idea that I think I'm thinking becomes actually mine if there is a necessity of the mediation through the universal potentiality of thinking? Emmanuel Ecoccia explains it quite clearly, quote, the singularity does not define the being of the idea, uh, does not define the being of the idea, but its use, its actualization. As such, an idea is not singular or individual, mine, yours, his or hers, in its being. 
It becomes such only in the relation which in its use and in its concrete actualization is acquired by this or that man or woman. End of quote. And he continues uh, further. To affirm the unity of the material intellect of the substance of everything that can be thought signifies to substitute the question of the subjectivity of thinking with one of its mediality. Medialita. The position of the notion of material intellect responds to the demand of defining the question of subjectivity within the one more vast and concrete of the mediality. End of quote. Averroes' conception of the intellect is thus a conception in which an individual, in order to think, has to participate in the general potentiality of thinking, elevate oneself to it, or universalize oneself step by step, as Jean-Baptiste Brenner has put it. And this practice, this use of the original speculative plasticity, is possible only through images. This is why images are so important. It is through images that the individual acquires thought, learns to think. Images are necessary intermediary of beings through which and in which the connection of the individual intellect with the universal material intellect, the one that uh, Averroes calls copulatio, is accomplished. So uh, we have to copulate with uh, material intellect through images in order to think. Thinking does not arise from itself, but is a composition in which the image plays a crucial role of conjoining sensible data of individual subject on the one hand, and the pure potentiality of thinking on the other. The image is thus a synthesis of the sensible with the intelligent. This is another revolutionary aspect of Averroes' thought, the one that makes it unacceptable for the latin readers of Aristotle and very close to concreteness and materiality of the world. The unity of the intellect does not force the individual subject into the abstraction of the pure potentiality. Thanks to the mediation of images, thinking is strictly connected with sensible world and participates in the universality of the intelligible. There is no absolute break between the reason and the senses. On the contrary, there is no thinking which would not be inspired by some sort of sensibility. There is no thinking without images. So probably the starting point one of the starting points of this denigration of visibility or images uh, is in this uh, misinterpretation of Averroes and then, of course, with Descartes and all the modern tradition in which uh, rational thinking had to be elevated above the senses. According to, but it started uh, earlier, probably. According to Emanuele Coccia, the image creates a new relation between the sensible and the intelligible as well as builds certain attitudes or ability thanks to which every individual intellect can feel connected with pure potentiality. It is very important to note that for Averroes, images are not representations of things, but rather media in which the connection between the sensible and the intelligible is located. The idea that images and the sensible and the sensible in general would be in any sense against the reason or irrational by nature is thus totally absurd. So in one move we avoid both, I think, the so-called oculocentrism, so in which vision is the represented, as a representation is a kind of equivalent of reason, and on the one on the other hand, iconoclasm would say in order to think one has to get rid of sensibility. <clears throat> the Averroist uh, lesson on the images is thus twofold. On the one hand, they are absolutely necessary for the production of thought. On the other, they are the emblem of contingency, limitation, because they are just mediated. So there is no hype. There is no point in uh, hypostasizing, uh, substantializing images. They are crucial and still just uh, medial. They are, as Jean-Luc Godard would say, just images in the absence of the just image that could impose itself as a substantial and fundamental being. 
For Coggia, who follows into the footsteps of Averroes, images are, quote, now from this book, Sensible Life, later on, special beings for which one needs a special kind of micro-ontology, a form of regional ontology, capable of positing any, another kind of being, the being of the images beyond the being of things, of mind and of consciousness. And in the same book, uh, Kodja uh, writes, in one of his comments on Aristotle, Averroes will say that the being of images is something in between the being of things and the being of souls, between bodies and spirit. Forms that exist outside of the soul have purely corporeal being, while those that exist within the soul have a purely spiritual being. The being of images is necessary for this very reason, continues Averroes, because it constitutes the only element that permits nature to pass from the spiritual to the corporeal domain and vice versa. In order that the spiritual can grasp and take possession of the corporeal, a middle term is necessary. End of quote. Images are thus crucial because they are responsible for nothing less than the unity of the world. Which, this unity in Averroes is neither physical nor spiritual or metaphysical, but as Kocher uh, beautifully says, medial. Uh, now, a couple of uh, reflections on, uh, on the notion of sharing uh, in, this, uh, in this vision. Because I think we, we could talk about four forms of sharing in this uh, idea of, that Avera stands for. The first one is that every cognitive act divides the subject because uh, for the individual intellect uh, it is an experience of thinking and being thought at the same time. So there is a sharing between me, myself as thinking as, and me as being thought by this or being activated by the um, connection to the uh, universal uh, potentiality. Since one cannot have cognitions without the mediation of the common intellect, there is an inherent break in the subject's continuity. This division uh, within the subject is also a division which is uh, ambiguous, something that could be uh, interpreted, I think, with the use of Ranciere's partage du sensible, this sharing of the sensible, because it also has this double uh, side of uh, sharing as uh, distancing, which is I get my share and you get yours, and bringing together as when we share a space or share some common destiny. Or in another vocabulary this could be also uh, explained by the notion of, uh, which was used by Deleuze and Guattari uh, in anti oedipus of disjunctive synthesis. So the synthesis that is accomplished permutations, separations, and divisions of the paradoxical, so to speak, form of uh, synthesizing things through differentiation. The second form of sharing is that every act of cognition explains the aspect, contains, sorry, the aspect of division as well as collection. So every form of thinking is both uh, cutting out and bringing together. This results from a various structure of the intellect and its different faculties or capacities. This is a very complicated uh, <clears throat> aspect, so I really would cut it to the basics. Thus, every act of cognition is a sort of montage. For a various, the intellect is divided into three instances. Imagination that conserves what senses have perceived, have per perceived. something that uh, is called cogitative which does not really exist in modern philosophy, this uh, instance in the intellect, which is called cogitative, which under the influence of the intellect cuts, acts upon images uh, that went uh, through senses, separating them or collecting them with the intentions, which means this uh, uh, 
uh, abstracted uh, forms uh, of, uh, of perception and making them into thoughts. Which, yeah, this is how abstraction goes. It's, uh, we have uh, the sensual da data, then the cognitive uh, either separates uh, the perception from the intentions, which means that like proto thoughts and make it into abstraction, or collects it to, to another and then uh, creates another uh, thought out of uh, different kinds of data. And then the third instance is, of course, memory, which guards what the former instance has extract, extracted from images in order to then use it again in another act. Third form uh, of sharing is that every act of cognition is a montage of heterogeneous forms of experience, different kinds of cogitaciones, or rather something that used to be quite varied before Descartes called them all cogitaciones, thus privileging rational thinking over every other forms of cognition. Before this moment, the opposition between thinking and all the rest was not functioning. Yes, so Descartes uh, came and, <laughs> and said, uh, let's call all this uh, emotional, affective, uh, memory, uh, experience cogitaciones, because they're just uh, versions of, uh, of the same thing. And then in the second move, of course, it all uh, was uh, replaced by cogite, uh, rest cogitans, which would be just thinking, abstract, rational thinking, which took place of the whole variety of experience, possible experience of the subject. And before Descartes, there was not such hierarchy at all. Putting it differently, in the more contemporary terms, there, we would say, there are no turns in cognition. We cannot, like in you know, this humanities terms that are so famous, we cannot have memory without the affect, as we cannot have language without images. Instead of memorial, affective, linguistic, or visual turns, one sh we should perhaps think about their continuity, if not continuity. And this is a very ancient lesson, actually. Fourth form of sharing is that every act of condition, uh, cognition functions in a split temporality. As Koch explains, quote, every thought in act epitomizes and abbreviates two different temporalities. Eternity, which does not tolerate mutations or needs to be guaranteed, uh, needs to be generated, sorry, and the time subjected to the rhythm and of birth and destruction. Yes, because uh, when we are Thinking, we are connected to the uh, general intellect. This does not uh, is not temporal, and yet the thought is uh, uh, happening in time. So it's uh, ambiguous in terms of uh, temporality. We have here two types of temporality: the horizontal, objective, linear, eventful, and vertical. How we could think the latter, the vertical one, otherwise than the eternity, as the eternity. Would it be a pure potentiality of time, or time as pure receptivity, irreducible to any concrete being functioning in time, but giving it this time necessary for it to happen? Would it be this kind of time that is given, always just given, as in Heidegger, as gibt Zeit, the very abstract, in a sense abstract, and in a sense very concrete, uh, as gibt Zeit? not being really further explained, or the strange giving time mode analyzed by Jacques Derrida in his book, uh, Donne l'Etat. For this late, last one, Derrida, one could find a very interesting uh, fragment in his reflections on the relation between time and visibility in the book that I mentioned in English, it's given time, forfeit money. This is a very long commentary of one uh, prose by Baudelaire about forfeit money. Quote, time in any case gives nothing to see. It is, a, it is at, the very last, at the very least the element of invisibility itself. Uh, it withdraws itself from visibility. One can only be blind to time, to the essential disappearance of time, even as 
Nevertheless, in a certain manner, nothing appears that does not require and take time. So time is also, in a sense, this diaphanous or this transparency uh, in Aristotle and other views reflections. In all those cases of sharing, there is a similar dynamic which one could summarize in the etymological equation very common in the late and middle ages, which uh, equated cogitatio with co-agitatio. Co-agitation should be perhaps treated not a, not, uh, here not as a cogitatio collecta, which is collective thinking or thinking as collecting, but as co-agitation in a double sense. First, as common mutual agitation of the elements of experience, which would be a collective animation, exaltation of particles in order to bring them closer, make them intertwine or, and interact. So this cogitatio is really a common animation between different kinds of uh, experiences, different, kind, different par particles of experience, uh, different data and so on. And second, co-agitation could also mean, with a political undertone, a collective agitation, a propaganda within the subject, or among its, among its attitudes, a civil war of faculties, <coughs> nerves, and thoughts. Averroes announces here, again, Freudian idea of the subject as a constant struggle, clash of different forces, an inherent politicized space. In a common, inter common intellect, is a, if a common intellect sorry, is a pure potentiality of thinking, as transparency is a pure potentiality of vision, one could say that the common does not think, just as much as we could say that transparency is not visible or that it does not see. To the question whether a collective can think, we still have more or less two mutually exclusive answers. I totally exaggerate here, but it's for the purpose. Value. First is that the collective can think and that its thinking assumes, has to assume some form. And this form traditionally was a form of consciousness. For example, class consciousness uh, embodied by the party in the most advanced uh, theoretical uh, version of Gorgi Lukacs in History of Class Consciousness, which is a brilliant book, but it finishes with saying that actually if collective has to think, it has to think through a party form. It's a very brilliant idea. I think it's denigrated by historical circumstances, but philosophically it's, it's a very great book. Uh, although difficult. Uh, second is that the collective cannot think, which makes it a sort of counterpart for thinking. You know, the collective stands for what does not think. Of course, it also logically does not think because, you know, thinking, uh, I mean, I can think, you can think, but we as a collective, we cannot really have thoughts, you know, together. Uh, an undifferentiated mass, in this vision, the collective is an undifferentiated mass which is characterized by the absence or exclusions of the thought and reason. That would be perhaps the version, the most extreme version of reading of the uh, philosophy of, uh, of collective. So the collective is either a super subject, a structure that regulates thinking beyond the reach of the individual intellect, or is uh, the ex eclipse of thinking, in which individual individualities descend beneath the capacity to think. You know? So we either go above to form a party or we uh, descend to this uh, mob that does uh, not think at all. How thinking and collective could function between or outside these polarities? How to preserve the idea of the common intellect without transforming it into a hypostasis of the individual subject, so to structure it as if it was an individual subject? This is like a pre-modern metaphysic version, yes, so we yeah. have a soul together that thinks for us and so on. That's not acceptable even for Averroes, I think. Uh, uh, because, mainly, this is the idea of collective, which is just a higher version of the individual, which 
does not make sense, I think. Or an administrative structure, but also do not exclude collectivity from thinking. So how to co uh, construct the form of collective thinking without this uh, recurs to individual form, nor to the idea that the collective just excludes thinking at all. Uh, and here I don't have really an answer, but I have uh, three figures that I would like to share with you uh, uh, yes, in, the, in the conclusion. Um, <clears throat> the first one comes from a uh, 19th, uh, uh, 19th century uh, uh, English poet, Gerald Manley Hopkins, who formulated his own version of Cogito, quite oppositional to the Cartesian version of I think, therefore I am, I exist. And he called it a self-taste. And it was uh, extensively commented, uh, I think, even as early as in the 50s uh, by Joseph Kelly's Miller, then you know, the leading uh, scholar in American reconstruction, and then uh, lay very much later commented by Jean Derrida in his text, Justices. And I quote here from the notebooks uh, and papers of, of Hopkins. I taste myself, therefore I exist. Myself being my consciousness and feeling of myself, that taste of myself, of I and me above, all, above and in all things, is more distinctive than the taste of ale or alum, more distinctive than the smell of walnut leaf or camphor, and is incommunicable by any means to another man." End of quote. This experience of myself is so original, primal and intimate that the only metaphor suitable for the poet is a taste. It seems like even before the Lacanian mirror stage there was a sort of taste stage in the process of ego formation. Nevertheless, this moment of the feeling of oneself, the out of affection, in which I am most intimately connected with myself, is also a moment of generating the minimal difference within myself. Moreover, this adherence to myself would appear, in fact, as the adherence to something not yet singular, beneath even the possibility to have any point, any stance of identity. It is thus the moment when, before even the recognition in the mirror image or possibility to say I and differentiate from not I, self taste is somehow universal. It is the taste of myself and everything else, which is in a sense signaled by Hopkins when he writes about me above and in all things. The most primitive, archaic experience of myself is therefore a taste of the world, a taste of the very possibility of taste in which the difference between me and everything else is still to come. It is the moment in which there are plenty of images, although neither of them could be subsumed under the category of representation or resemblance to, a, to the established beings rooted in, this, in the world image. And yet these phantasmata already mediate between my inner self and myself, as well as between the world and its taste for me. The second uh, figure is a figure of exercise. I mean, I try to you know, s suggest certain <coughs> moments in which uh, uh, there is a, a very uh, individual experience which is, uh, it could be th thought as, as a form of thinking or pre-thinking which is the more individual it is, the more common it is. This, this is basically the logic. So the second one is exercise. To use a scholastic vocabulary, one could say that the exercise is the experience of acquiring potentiality. If I was learning just the actual thing, you know, just not the potentiality of something, but the actual doing something, there would be no sense in talking about the process of learning. I would just start to, I don't know, play piano or play football. I cannot do it because I don't 
I'm not able to do it yet. If there is a need to exercise, it means that I have to learn the potentiality to play first in order to then actually use it. It's quite logical, I cannot play piano before I'm actually capable of doing it. However, everyone knows that this logical order is never a practical one. We learn to play by playing. It means that in the process of exercising, there is a constant movement and hesitation between the potentiality and the actuality, the capacity and practice. We come here to the classical problem of Averroes' philosophy, which is the problem of learning, transmission of knowledge. If there is the unique material intellect, how is it possible that I have some thoughts and you don't, and then you, have, you can have it with me? When I say thought, I also mean, uh, of course, all the other forms of cognition that constitute the complexity of human experience. Unfortunately, maybe fortunately, we cannot go into details here, but the solution of this very scholastic problem uh, suggested by Averroes in his commentary to Aristotle's uh, On the Soul is that this thought, you know, this thought that I have and you don't, and then you also have it. So it was transmitted somehow, but uh, how is it possible when there is a common intellect? So the solution is that this thought uh, is multiple only according, according to the subject to which it is true, so me or you. But it's also one, unique, according to its content, which means according to its very intelligibility, or in other words, according to its connection to this intellect, which is common and material. It is thus one in the unique material intellect and multiple in the forms of imagination that shape it. Again, the images are responsible for differentiating the unique thought among the subjects that acquire it. The exercise is the process of successive acquisition of the thought through imagination and its diversifying nature. At the same time, this process is the one of coming closer to the common intellect, functioning as the instance of the unification of cogitaciones. So we learn and then we differentiate think, uh, thoughts because uh, through images uh, we actually make this thought different for me and for you, but at the same time we come closer to this general intellect in which this thought is uh, somehow located. But this would, be, this would not be possible if the images were the property of the subject and not the medium of its transition from one state to the other. And the last big figure uh, is a figure of a dream which also appears uh, often in Averroes, but also in commentaries. Emmanuel Ecoccia wrote in his book Sensible Life, which is uh, a kind of uh, modern contemporary philosophical essay filled with Averroes. It's not that Averroes commented there, but it's really just, uh, it's not a vulgar version because uh, it's very, Subtle, but at the same time, it's, it's an Averroes made contemporary. So he wrote in the book that in the dream, the border between me and the world disappears, thus opening up the perspective of the mixture. In the dream, I am everything that I dream, including the figure of me. Yes, when I dream that I go for a walk, uh, I'm myself in the dream, I'm a walk, I'm a street, everything is me. So the boundary between me and everything else is really. Kocha, I mean, blurred is not a word, it's, it's differentiated in a very special manner. It's not divided, uh, it's not separated, it's differentiated differently, so to speak. Kocha mentions in his reflections on the sensible experience of dreaming the category invented by, uh, surprisingly, Jose Ortega y Gasset, uh, the Spanish uh, philosopher known for this. Uh, Revolt of Masses uh, essay, mostly. The idea of intra-body, which is intra -quel. And he uh, writes, unlike the exterior body, the intra-body has no color or defined form. It is not purely visual object. It is made up of sensations of movement or touch, of impressions of expansions or contractions, 
of vessels, by small perceptions of the course of blood in veins and arteries, of sensations of pain and pleasure. Unlike the exterior body, whose phenomenon and appearance is separable from its existence, the intra-body completely corresponds with the range of sensations, emotions and phenomena through which those who experience it come to know it." End of quote. In the dream, then, the body is no longer a physical block visible from outside, but something that Kocha calls, and I really like it, the stream of bodiness. You know, he refers to stream of consciousness as an already established context, uh, con uh, concept, and he says, you know, there is also some, something like a stream of bodiness. A plastic and dynamic mixture of sensations which decide upon the shape of the body's existence. The same dynamic is at play in every corporeal experience, although it is weakened and suppressed by the presence of consciousness. In dreams, the body is liberated and fully coincides with its images. What is important here, and uh, could form a sort of proposition for, I mean, introductory proposition for visual studies, is that all these experiences coincide incessantly. When I taste myself, I am so close to myself as if I were dreaming. In the dream, I exercise because I constantly change my form, and so on and so forth. Each time, the closer I am to my inner self, the more I share with others. And this exchange is guaranteed, but nothing else but images. Those operators of difference in unity, plasticity and stability. Images are thus all over the place, common and yet very visible.